Okay, it's recording. You made plenty of space for it. Five hours. <sighs> That's not enough. Thank you for listening to That Gets My Goat? Really? Screw you guys. Hi, everybody. This is Big Anklevich here. And this is Rich Outfield. Welcome to another episode of That Gets My Goat. It's uh, another in our little series of summer movie reviews that we tend to do pretty much every summer. Summer movies kind of hijack That Gets My Goat when summer comes around, although... We were talking about this last week. It feels like there's not as many summer movies that we're going to care about this year as there have been in past years. Does that sound true to you, or am I making this crap up? Oh, I don't know. I, it seems like there are plenty of movies, but stuff that appeals to both me and you. Um, it's probably few and far between. And, and last year we had only three or four episodes, I think, the whole yeah. summer. Well, we don't have a Pixar movie this year, and so maybe that's so there's that. one fewer. There's but. less superhero movies. There's no DC superhero movie this year. That's right. Still got a while to wait for Star Wars. There's no Star Trek this year, although we haven't done Star Trek. I don't think we ever at have. At all, uh, have we? We didn't even do it the first one? Because I actually saw that Oh, one. no, we, we did do it the first one, because you saw it like the night before I did. Yeah. But yes, yeah, so tell the people what we saw tonight. Well, today we saw X-Men Days of Future Past, which seems like it may be the last movie before perhaps Guardians of the Galaxy. Although we did see some trailers that looked interesting. Who knows what we'll see after this, if anything. Well, I, I'm sure I will see something. Whether we want to talk about it or not, no one can say. That's true. That's true. There may be more summer movie fun coming your way. But at least we'll be back with the Guardians of the Galaxy. And we recorded like a buttload, a full metric buttload of That Gets My Goat episodes that are just waiting to get released. And because these movie ones kind of are more timely, we throw them in out of order. And so uh, we'll have plenty to fill the space between now and Guardians of the Galaxy if there's no other movie that we go to. But yeah, we saw X-Men Days of Future Past, which uh, was interesting. Um, it was the return of Brian Singer, right? He directed this movie, but he only produced the last X-Men first class That's right. movie. And he had nothing to do with X-Men 3 because he had left to do Superman Returns. That's basically true. I mean, he did develop that a little bit, and he was named one of the producers because you know, he was he going to be the director, and then he dropped out, and Fox hired Matthew Vaughn to direct it. And Matthew Vaughn dropped out, and Brett Ratner came on board. And so uh, with the last one, with First Class, Matthew Vaughn did direct that one, and he was set to direct this one. And then he dropped out, and Brian Singer stepped in. So it's interesting that he, you know, he's the one that started the, the ball rolling, so to speak, and he did the 2000 X-Men, and he did X-Men 2. And now here he is with, depending on how you see it, X-Men 7 or X-Men 5 or... Or X Men X Men First Class Two, right? Yeah, it's it, it's <laughs> it's a sequel to a number of films, and uh, I, I think that they made that pretty clear. I don't know, was it at all confusing to you? Uh, there were a, a few spots where I was slightly confused, but they explained it. You know, it was like, whoa, wait, what? That doesn't work with what I understand to be. But then they explained, and then there's some other things where maybe it didn't work at all for example right at the beginning we see charles xavier doing his thing at the end of x-men 3 x-men you know no, what was x3 called the last stand the la at the okay, at the end of the last stand charles xavier dies and they have the little post credit thing where he wakes up in somebody else's body and says, hey, Moira McTaggart, how are you doing, lass? So how he's back in his own body, which is dead and gone somehow in that timeline, is a little confusing. Uh, it seems like they just kind of said, you know what, we're just going to forget about that part. But they didn't forget about other parts. 
they did flash back to X-Men, to a couple of shots from X-Men 3. Yeah, they had some stuff from X-Men 3, and so you knew that Jean really did die in this timeline, but somehow... Did you see The Wolverine? I never have seen that oh, okay, one. so you I haven't seen see all that. of them. The Wolverine took place after X-Men 3, and it acknowledged that X-Men 3 happened. And so that was a little bit of preparation for this, and at the very end of The Wolverine... Xavier and Magneto come to Wolverine and say, you know, we, we need your help. And Wolverine is super surprised to see Xavier alive because after X-Men 3, of course, Xavier was dead. And uh, I sort of expected that we would get an explanation for that. Explanation. But I think this film that we saw today probably took place 10 years after that. I don't know. There, there was a moment when the alarm clock went off and it had the date on it. And I was trying to figure... I, mean, I uh, just couldn't... I couldn't see... But when they were saying that 1973 was 50 years ago, I figured, okay, we are dealing with a future. Yeah, but fi what is 50 years from... That's 2023? Right. So that's not far from now. No, it's like nine years from now. Because, yeah... Ten they... years from X-Men... Or ten years from The Wolverine. Yeah, it was. that was one of those things that was kind of difficult... A little bit, the whole trying to bring it all together, I guess, and still harmonize. And yeah, you never explained why Xavier's alive and they not in the Wolverine nor in this one, uh, unfortunately. But for the most part, it didn't bother me. Right, it, it it lent itself better to just going with it, to just saying, hey, some things happened some things didn't some characters that you know are going to be in this and some characters aren't and we're not going to explain why i mean there was a couple of, uh, of shots you know to show people from first class had already died in the what 11 years since that movie took yeah place. and he throw he throws out all the names like azazel and who else was there in that film that i think they said angel and and uh, was angel in the and first banshee one? Banshee, Both yeah, he died. didn't mention his name. Um, was Angel in that first one, though? Well, it was the, the girl Angel that Lenny Kravitz's oh, daughter oh, Zoe Oh, right, played. right, okay. And, and you saw, her, you saw wings her wings in the Pentagon, yeah, and you saw, I guess, Banshee's chest Plate. Pe piece. Yeah, I think. His cod piece uh. was there. <laughs> okay, so, things that I thought was really cool about this, first of all, was seeing all the actors. They had everybody back. That was really neat to see everybody that had played these characters. And we had old version, young version, and they were all back. Wait, wait, wait. We only had old version, young version of Magneto, Xavier, and Logan. We didn't have old. We young had of old else. version and young version of Hank. <laughs> that's a good point. You did for a very short period. <laughs> that's that's true. Yes, I guess that's probably true that was all the ones that we had old and young versions of but it was neat to see all you know we had the act the same actors that were old and young versions were all back they didn't did they replace anybody it seemed like i mean they even brought the dude that was Iceman back who is has he done anything else in his <laughs> career i've never seen that guy again i don't think well he's a canadian actor he shows up on television a lot and he's got a bunch of brothers that look exactly like he yeah. does He's always in those but, Vancouver TV shows. Uh, yes, he is. <laughs> like but, all the Vancouver actors um, are. See, I thought Rogue was conspicuously absent, considering she was such a, an important part of that first movie. Uh, but you said that all of her scenes got cut. Was there a reason Yeah, for that? Uh, I th they shot scenes with Anna Paquin in them. Um, and then when they went to edit the movie down, they realized, you know what? Her scenes are, they're just fluff. There's nothing to them they don't move the story in any way they're just hey look at me i'm back too kind of scenes and so they finally decided that they had to cut them huh and so that's what happened with those and well see I i'm sure her. you'll get to see them on the dvd or whatever on youtube or wherever you get your deleted scenes from but she did get her tiny little cameo and her huge credit like right on the top <laughs> which yes. i thought was kind of interesting as did you um, but yeah, it was so cool to see all these people, and it took me a second to realize who all of them were too, because they're in this so far much time future, and, oh. and it had been such a long time. And you know, they've got Iceman with a beard to try and make him look old, because he still looks super young. They had uh, 
Ellen Page. Actually, she, I didn't recognize her at first as being, uh, you know, the one doing that thing to Bishop's head. Oh, yeah, that's right. Because at some point in the middle of the movie, you said, hey, Kitty. And yeah, I thought, after huh. they'd said, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was weird. You, you didn't realize when she was phasing through walls and all that well, stuff. Well, I figured it was, I mean, was I guess that one, was yeah? Kitty Pride, but I didn't realize it was the, it was Ellen Page as oh, okay. Kitty Pride. And you see her, and even when she said, too late, and they disappeared, I didn't realize that that was her. It wasn't until they, she wasn't, I guess, in an action part or something like that, that it, she appeared more like her. I don't know. Did you recognize her from the beginning? I, I did, I but but I knew she was going to be in this, and, and even if she didn't look like herself, when she and Bishop were phasing through walls and stuff, I would have been like, oh, is that, oh, okay, that is her. I'm a little slower on the uptake, and I know no, a right. less about the world, too. There was several mutants, like Bishop, and I was asking you, I'm sure annoying you here and there with questions about things, like, what in the hell is Bishop's power? Obviously, from what I could tell, he has to be charged up by somebody. Yeah, he charges up with pink energy, I guess, and, and it, it fuels his weapon, which is it, cool. I mean, Bishop came about... At the very tail end of when I was reading um, X Men comics, and so, yeah, I, I just I knew what he looked like and the, about the pink energy, but I, I didn't remember what his power was. Okay, so but you is. but you did recognize Colossus, and you recognized him as being the same. Is Colossus it? This, it was X2 the same actor, right? Yeah. He looks like the same actor, but it's a, that that guy was the one that I was really wondering. Is it the same guy? Because it's been such a long time, and he was so minor. Yeah, I think Daniel Cudmore is his name. So. He was always so minor in all those early films that that's cool that they got him, you know, because who knows? You know, some of those people, they, they were so minor and they were just, you know, oh, here's a guy. He's not a big deal, so we don't need to cast an actor. We just need somebody that's big or something. And you wonder if they're going to bring that same dude back again. But I guess he, just, again, really didn't have all that much to do. He just fought a lot. Because he was only in the future, not in the past. He was too young to be in the past scenes. We are the future, Charles. Not them. <laughs> um, so what did you think of the... Uh, let's just say, use the word... The mechanism for getting these two groups together. The first class group and the original trilogy group, if you will. The me you mean the days of future past send somebody back in time mechanism or just the time right, travel story, mechanism? storytelling mechanism? Wow, that is loud. Yeah, that's like got to be a mile away and you can hear it that loud. Crazy. Uh, I liked that. I think it worked out fine. It reminds me of the Star Trek reboot where they took new Star Trek and old Star Trek and kind of melded them together via time traveling or well, it was there was oh. travel involved right I, I mean that but that was the introduction of new star trek whereas first class had had its own movie already right right i thought that was cool that they were able to take it and meld them together that way with the time travel and like jj abrams was able to do and just say hey boom new timeline everything's going to be different here's where we are this is not like old Star Trek. This is now new Star Trek. And all these things can happen again. They can happen differently. We can have Khan come along and be relatively insignificant or, or whatever. You know, I thought it was kind of an ingenious way to, hey, we're going to reboot, but still acknowledge the old one. It's just like, yeah, hey, this is alternate timeline. Let's call this and Star Trek 2009 a soft reboot. Where, you know, you have a mechanism to say the original stuff still happened, but a hard reboot is none of it happened. We are the future, Charles, not them. <laughs> is that fair? Is that a cool Okay, term? we can do that. This, is, this one was kind of a soft reboot, and it makes me think of when we went to Comic-Con in 2000, was it six or eight that we saw I've Jason, or, all... sorry, we saw Brian Singer. I only went to those two. We saw Brian Singer, and it was post Superman. Would that be two thousand eight? No, I think it was two thousand six. Two thousand six. It okay. was the same year the Last Stand had come out. Right, the Last Stand had come out, and they were post uh, Superman Returns. Brian Singer was doing basically like a hey, 
by the DVD uh, panel, <laughs> more or less. And somebody got up and asked him a question. Hey, if you were to go back and do X-Men again, what would you do? And he said, huh, let's see. <laughs> Who's left? And everybody chuckled because, yeah, at the end of Last Stand, they kind of said, okay, this is the end. We're not doing X-Men anymore. They're all dead. Everybody you care about. We killed this person, this person, this person, and all that's left is the less significant ones that you weren't attached to and Wolverine. But a lot of movies have done that. Yeah. Christopher Nolan has done that. Yeah, I'm not just saying to that... To say it's got to be a trilogy rather than, hey, we're just going to do these forever, guys. Yeah. I'm not saying that that is unusual, but I'm just saying that Brian Singer was saying that. And now Brian right. Singer's back, and he yeah. has... Took a while, but... Soft rebooted it back to where it was when he left it, more or less. I thought that was kind of a brilliant move. Oh, you're talking well. about the end of this movie. Yeah, this is... That's that's what you mean by the soft reboot. Right, we're jumping ahead to the end and to... Uh, by the way, spoiler alert, there will be spoilers. Don't listen if you haven't seen it. It may be too late to save any spoilers, but by now you ought to know better. Yeah, see, I'm trying to think of, of uh, another movie in which this has been done. And the, and the only one that comes to mind besides Star Trek 2009 is Star Trek Generations where it's a next generation movie but it also includes some of the original cast movie stuff right. as well with time travel sort of you know I mean with a, a derivative of time travel but they never went back after that as far as I know to the original crew or anything like that from that but it was a passing of the baton right and I get the feeling that this was a passing of the baton too with Brian Singer saying, hey, this is my farewell to those characters that I gave you 14 uh -huh. years ago. Um, the ending, I, I felt like the ending of this movie was the end, was the last time we will see Patrick Stewart or, or, or any of those. And that's why so many of them were willing to come back. I can see that being the case because I think the next sequel will be back in the 70-ish timeline. You know, we won't be all the way forward, and we won't be seeing Jean Grey, old Jean Grey. Femke Jansen will not be back as Jean Grey, but somebody will probably, you know, they'll go and they'll find Jean Grey, and they'll be putting the X-Men together again with these people as the young versions of themselves. See, I would be fine with that, but it still leaves the question, who's left? Because this movie did kill a lot of characters, from X-Men First Class. And it's strange that they would kill off Emma Frost since she's such a popular character and could do a lot of fun stuff. And that also is another one of those problems with the timeline. <laughs> Emma Frost was in Wolverine Origins. Yes, she was. Which is a future from this one. But that timeline is gone. Wolverine Origins, X-Men oh. 1, 2, and 3 are done. You know what? Emma movie. Frost was also in... The other one, too, wasn't she? I forgot about that. She was in First yeah, Class. That's, that's what, that's I, what I meant. About. First Class she was in. I forgot that she was even in that movie. That's interesting. But if in this, the next movie they decide to show, you know, Gene and Scott, and uh, it seems like there's got to be somebody else that I'm forgetting. Gene, Scott, Storm. Oh, Storm, yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe we'll get old uh, Alan Cumming back for... They, uh, yeah, they could easily do Nightcrawler oh, again. Nightcrawler but I wouldn't was, do Alan Cumming. He was, well, These I all have to be... Him again and, oh, it's sorry, we're Scottish talking about something else. You like so much. No, but I'm saying that they would all have to be 12, 13, 14, 15 years right, old. Right, yeah, Which be is fine. It's, well, that's the advantage of rebooting a series or restarting or whatever you want to call it where you can go back and get younger, cheaper actors. <laughs> yep. Although most of the people that our actors, aside from Halle Berry, who I'm sure still wants lots of money, and Patrick Stewart, James Marston is not going to cost you much. <laughs> and Famke Janssen, I don't, I don't know what else she's got on her plate, but I bet it's not a lot. Right, and as a little Except aside, a, we are aware that the next X-Men movie comes out in 2016. It's already got a title. It's called X-Men Apocalypse. And uh, there is a little coda at the end of this movie that sort of introduces that. But we don't know anything about it, except for the Brian Singer is doing it. 
Um, and it involves it's called, apocalypse. And it, 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 the title is X-Men Funny. Apocalypse, and it comes out I, you know, tw- summer 2016. Notice they didn't call it Age of Apocalypse because we've already got Age of Ultron. So yeah, it's, good. It's good, ruined. Right. And uh, <laughs> Right. We can talk about that at the end of this episode, but my guess is that's going to be a first class part three. Yeah, I think and so And there too. won't be, unless Wolverine is in it, uh, any of the the. the classic cast if you want to say or the, the the 2000 cast it seems like wolverine i wouldn't be surprised if wolverine's in that because wolverine is basically the same in all of them he didn't <laughs> change he doesn't age that, that's their whole thing although he did have some gray on the temples for the old guy but yeah i mean he could be he was in first class he had his uh cameo and uh you know he can he can be in that or not be in that. I see. I, I think they wrote an excellent out for him in that uh, if he's not in it, if they choose not to have him in it, it's because, you know, he's being held by Stryker, may, being part of the Weapon X program and all that right. stuff. And you can use that as an ex- uh, excuse. But uh, I would think he wouldn't be in it because of that. He, he would be busy elsewhere being tortured, etc. So that he probably won't be in that one. But it seems like him and Wolverine, they're like the one constant through all of these X-Men movies. And he is the most popular and the draw to everything. Everybody loves Hugh Jackman. Yeah, they do. And rightly so. And I was about to say the least successful X-Men movie was the one that didn't feature Hugh Jackman. But I don't know that that's true anymore. I think the least successful X-Men movie was The Wolverine. So, The so Wolverine, the last one that just came right. out, was less successful? Yeah. And see, when we were talking about Spider-Man, we were talking about the law of diminishing returns. The Spider-Man 2 made less than Spider-Man 1, and 3 made less than 2, and 3 and a half, whatever you call The Amazing, made less than 3, and Amazing Spider-Man 2 made less than... Amazing Spider-Man, and I think that had sort of been the case in, with the X-Men since The Last Stand, except for this movie made a buttload of money. I mean, it made this week more than the last one made its entire run. So, you know, Fox is probably buoyed up by that and excited to continue with the franchise, whereas you got to wonder what Sony is worried about or thinking about with the Spider-Man franchise. Has Spider-Man just kind of died off? I heard it made a lot of money overseas, did it not? It did. It may make its money back. <laughs> Certainly not here, but internationally, yeah. Especially having China as, as a a market. But, you know, it's not enough for a movie just to make its money back, right? I would assume, but I don't know how long, you know, beyond that. I mean, that make its money back in theatrical run is is one thing but there's lots of other windows for uh, money to come in from for a property right but we never see the numbers on any of that stuff true and and so they don't tend to consider it as part of of the the gross of the film right but Uh, sometimes days of oh go ahead sometimes that kind of stuff will cause for more movies to be made i mean you look at serenity would there be a serenity movie were it not for the next window and all the DVD sales that uh, Firefly made. I mean, they sold so many DVDs that they're like, you know what? Maybe... I mean, it's like Family Guy, for example. Family Guy died. That was a dead show. Canceled and gone. And it sold so many DVDs that they started it back up. And it's been going for years since. And the same thing. Now they've got Futurama going again, don't they? I think Futurama is over again. Oh, but, it's, but it did have it a resurgence. Came back, yeah. But it came back again because of the popularity of the DVDs and the pat and you know the next window, the secondary, tertiary, etc. Windows that uh, properties can have. So you never know. No, you're right. You never know. And and I don't think Sony is going to give up on Spider-Man so soon. But I, the reason I bring it up is Amazing Spider-Man Two and X-Men: Days of Future Past had similar budgets. Fox spent about two fifty on this movie, uh-huh. which Gosh, I read somewhere is the biggest movie Fox has ever done. Yeah. And yet it's going to make its money back domestic. And yeah, internationally, all of that is is, is gravy. It's also much better received than Amazing Spider-Man 2 was. And so 
I think the the foundation for for many more sequels has been laid. Yeah. With the success of this movie, whereas the future for Sony Amazing Spider-Man sequels it seems really limited. Yeah, the future's so bright. Well, not so bright. We are the future, Charles. You don't need to wear shades for the future of Spider-Man, unfortunately. Not them. Every now and then you get things on pe- Facebook and stuff like that where people claim that some... it was I think it was a joke that went out on uh, April Fool's Day that certain properties were coming back to Marvel Studios. And uh, I just saw that again just a couple weeks ago. Somebody saying, oh, I wish I could tell you what I knew about Spider-Man. They, like, tweeted this on... You know, and and then, oh, maybe I shouldn't have put out that tweet. And then they deleted the tweet, and then somebody's put this out as, well, this person knows that Spider-Man's going back to Marvel Studios or something like that. Yeah, who knows when that will happen. We talked exhaustively about that when spy- when we did our we Spider-Man did, and, and I should We don't need to read I shouldn't have brought it up, but except for the these two are comparable in an interesting way. They're not mm-hmm. apples and oranges, except for that I thought one was good and one was bad. But they're also movies that are are, uh, tent poles for their studios not owned by Marvel Studios several in a long line of movies but I was much much more satisfied with Days of Future Past than I was with Amazing Spider-Man 2 and also a lot of the budget I think went to McKellen and Patrick Stewart and Hugh Jackman of course and and Jennifer Lawrence because of his Hugh Jackman Um, they had to uh, whereas in Amazing Spider-Man a lot of that budget was just wasted. It was right. just, well, let's make a mecha rhino instead of something affordable, something responsible. Anyhow, uh, the movie itself, it was pretty bleak, but it, it had a sense of humor, and I really enjoyed the, the 70s uh, <laughs> scenes. And yeah, let me just get out of the way. My favorite scene of the whole movie, and a week ago I would not have believed this but the scene where quicksilver runs around the room oh, yeah. and does all that fun little stuff in fast speed was awesome it was so much fun and i and, and after it was done i was just like oh joss now yeah. he's gonna have to work extra extra hard to make his quicksilver fun or you know as memorable as this quicksilver now granted he hasn't got a really terrible costume to worry about but just the the stuff they did with the fast speed in one scene was the kind of stuff that we talked about last time when we were talking about Spider-Man that Incredibles did with, oh, let's find some clever ways to use yeah. these powers, and Fantastic Four was unable to do. And, and just the music choice that they picked to go behind <laughs> that, where they have Jim Croce going, I could put time in a bottle, <laughs> while everything's frozen, and he's going around at normal speed and doing this and that and doing these little things here and there. It was pretty brilliant. One, because the song was from that time period, <laughs> and two, it went so well with the scene. It was just, it was great. Uh, and you had to let all that 70s stuff, and, and you know, when Wolverine comes out, of the hotel at the very start, and he's all in the the UG. I don't know. Some people love this look, but that brown leather jacket <laughs> that he had on, it's that was like the ultimate in my mind growing up of like the worst things that the the worst <laughs> thing that seventies had were those brown leather jackets. And then everybody started wearing them again in the nineties, and they became cool. So I don't know, but it comes out, and then they had the music that was like. <laughs> When they had the bongos going in the background, it was so, you know, we talked about right before the movie started about Starsky and Hutch. You did, yes. And, uh, yeah, I leaned over and said to you, oh, look, it's Starsky and Hutch. That's right. And, you know, because I was exactly like right out of it. And he got into the car that, I don't know what that car was, but it looked like a Batmobile. It looked like the 60s Batmobile to me, the Adam West Batmobile that he was driving around. I, I liked that stuff for sure. You know the one thing that I thought was really groundbreaking, perhaps? Okay. About this film was Peter Dinklage. Peter Dinklage is a little person. He was cast in the role of Bolivar Trask, who was not a little person, right? Not in the comics, no. In the comics, which I'm assuming is probably the only place he's ever really existed. Has he been in any of the... Oh, I'm sure they had him in cartoons, but... Okay. 
He was probably not a little person in any cartoon, I'm assuming, as well. But he was a little person in this movie. But, you know, there was never, ever, ever one time, and I watched for it, and I paid attention for it, anybody to say anything about that. I waited for somebody to do yeah, it, too. Nobody once said, oh, whatever, you're a dwarf, or anything. They never, ever, ever, it was not, it could have, it's like the, the thing that I've heard, you know, there, there, there are various minorities they're always trying they're always hoping to get more acceptance tolerance i'm not sure what the right word for it is but i remember and this may have been back about the time that halle berry won her oscar or s may have even been before that they were talking about you know black actors will know that they've really made it and they're really being accepted when they get cast for a role not because it's supposed to be a black character, but just because they're the best actor. And they didn't care whether they're black or white. It's just, you're the best actor. We're casting you as this person. And in this case, that had to be what they did. Or I don't know, maybe it's just because Peter Dinklage is cool. Because he is. I mean, he plays Tyrion on the, uh, on the Game of Thrones TV show. And he's one of those characters that people just like. He's a good character, even in the book, without Peter Dinklage having touched it in any way. He is an interesting and cool character. So he basically got handed, you know, a wheel that spins straw into gold when he got given that character to play in that show. And so it just made him cool. And I think, I'm guessing that's why they cast him, because you know what? This guy is cool. Everybody loves him. And they never once... It wasn't a character for a dwarf. This was not Willow. This was not Wicket or any character like that. This was. It wasn't even Tyrion, which is what you know won him his uh, coolness. It was just this is a guy. They could have cast anybody in that role, and I just thought it was so awesome that they cast him. And I mean, I'm assuming that's why. I don't know. Obviously, I wasn't in the room when they're making the decision. But I would assume it had to be because of that, or else they would have made mention at some point of his little person stature. I thought that was really neat. Yeah, see, it would have been so easy to draw attention to it and say, you understand prejudice. How come you can't see past this or whatever? But they didn't. It's just like, this is a guy, and he could have been anything. It could have been any actor playing him. So, yeah, that's, that's neat. And Dinklage is really, really cool. He is cool, and he did a great job with this uh, with this role. Uh, I thought all of his scenes were good, and he was never uh, unbelievable or anything. You know, he, he did a great job the whole way through. So, all around, Bolivar Trask, thumbs up. Yeah, I see. I don't know what we should talk about. I, I last year you and I talked, and I was disappointed that they had changed the comic book story. And had it be about Wolverine instead of be about Kitty Pride, But before that, my theory was because Jennifer Lawrence is suddenly a huge star and they've con got her contractually obligated to do this movie, that she would be the time traveler. And that they would they, swap out Kitty Pride for Mystique. And I sort of had come to terms with that, come to grips with that and thought, you know, that has potential for some really good story lines, so some story direction. But instead it was Wolverine. But what's weird is that they sold me on the Wolverine thing, too. As soon as it was done, I was like, no, no, that's cool. And part of it is Jackman is just so great <laughs> as Wolverine. Who wouldn't want to see more of him? Yeah, who his wouldn't naked butt see him? in that scene when he goes back was what you wanted oh, to see, wasn't point. it? That's what convinced you. Because you got to see more Yeah, I don't Wolverine. remember there being much... <laughs> butt work in the past for Wolverine. <laughs> but they still managed to give Jennifer Lawrence stuff to do. And I'm glad for that. And I don't I don't know if the end result would have been better with Jennifer Lawrence as the time traveler and all that. I it it could have worked. Either way. I mean and it well, there's no knowing. The thing that I couldn't understand is why did we skip 11 years. You know what I mean? It's like, what was significant about 1973 so that that's when we set it instead of 65 or 64 so it's exactly 50 years ago or, you know, 
You know what I mean? It was just strange well, to me that the, they, the first one took place in 62 because that's when the Cuban Missile Crisis was. Mm-hmm. But I, the end, must have of been the end of Vietnam, the Vietnam and that's War? why they, they, they did that? Maybe they just want to get Nixon in there somehow. <laughs> <laughs> the Nixon stuff I found pretty amusing. I mean, all the period stuff was really interesting. Like, whenever you would see the period, like, cam- uh, television footage or whatever, where just, like, the, the way the colors looked on television in those days was entertaining to me. And, uh, and yeah, we got a lot of really bad fashions and a couple of okay fashions. But, <laughs> they oh, geez, like Xavier's outfit was just ghastly. Oh, and there was the moment when young Magneto had... An ascot on, you know what I mean? <laughs> and a large dog that followed him around going, <laughs> Yeah, I, I wonder sometimes, you know, Jennifer Lawrence is a big star now. How much does Fox wish that she wasn't Mystique? You noticed how many times she was herself <laughs> when she, you know, she was trying to fit in with people and instead of becoming an extra... Uh, she was Jennifer Lawrence walking around and doing her thing. Even at the part where she like does the thing in Vietnam and she's disguised as Colonel whatever, and then suddenly she's done with that. She walks away and she turns into a, herself, and it's like, wouldn't a blonde, cute little girl stand out really like a sore thumb in the middle of a Vietnam war camp? That seems like the wrong thing to change into. But you know, I think it was just because we wanted to say, hey, look. Jennifer Lawrence, remember? Well, see, this will make me a hypocrite because I hate every single movie when the superhero takes his mask off over and over again just so you can see, hey, it's really Robert Downey Jr. It's really Andrew Garfield. It's really Tobey Maguire. It's really Don Knotts. But in this case, because it's Jennifer Lawrence and because she looks like a monster when she's not (laughs) Jennifer Lawrence, I mean, granted, yes, she could have looked like anyone, but I'm not going to (laughs) complain Yeah, I just thought, thought it was interesting, you know. I like it better there's... when it's her than when it's some guy who happens to have eyes that glow yellow so that we know that it was actually Misty. Mm-hmm. There's no reason to complain, but in the first set of movies, Mystique was played by Rebecca Romaine Stamos, and I think she became just Rebecca Romaine by the time the third one happened. She was always Mystique, and she got to play herself... One time, which I thought was awesome when we did see you, you're like, oh, hey, look, it's her being herself. Oh, that's that's neat. And then it was over. It was like one scene where she pretends to like this prison guard and then she just shoots him up with metal stuff so that Magneto can escape. Whereas Jennifer Lawrence was herself all the time. Now, I guess I can understand that because we're back in time and Jennifer Lawrence grew up with Charles Xavier and she always pretended to be that person. So it seems like it makes sense for her to go to that person again and again because it's probably the easiest, quickest, first thing you can do. And maybe what she sees herself as if she's not blue, scaly mystique. But yeah, I thought it was interesting how often that she did get to be Jennifer Lawrence just so they could let her be seen outside of her crazy costume because it's hard to tell through all that costume that that's even her, really. You don't look at her and think, oh, that is Jennifer Lawrence. If you saw the movie without her ever turning into herself, you know, I'd be hard-pressed. Somebody said, hey, who played Mystique? And I didn't know already. I'd be like, the girl played her? So I wonder if Fox wishes they'd cast Jennifer Lawrence as a different person instead of Mystique so that they could have kept her on, you know. They wish they'd cast her as that angel girl instead so they could have kept her around so you could see her instead of have her be the crazy blue person that you can't tell who it is but do you think jennifer lawrence makes a difference in any way i mean you talked about it at uh, comic-con that you went to and they had the <laughs> x-men panel and when they had the hunger games panel everybody's like oh jennifer lawrence we love you and every question was for jennifer lawrence and then they had the x-men panel and jennifer lawrence was just over there on the side drinking her water and nobody asked her a thing yeah i think anna paquin had as many questions as yeah like jennifer lawrence who cares there's hugh jackman here look at his Ackman. it's huge (laughs) 
Well, I, I, yeah, and I have no response to that because I friggin' love Jennifer Lawrence. She could be in every, every movie, movie that, that comes, comes out, out, and I would not complain. But this is me and half, half of America. America. <laughs> We're the future, child. I, just, I wonder how much of a difference she makes for this movie. Um, oh, box office wise. Yeah, just to do people say, "Oh, wow, Jennifer Lawrence is going to be in the new X Men movie. I'm going to see it." Or do the people that fell in love with her watching Hunger Games think, "Oh, I'm going to go see her in X Men because I love Jennifer Lawrence," or not? You know, uh, it's like probably not. It's like yeah. Hugh Jackman in that Australia movie. Did people go see Australia because they're like, "Hey, I liked him as Wolverine." So I'm going to go see Australia. <laughs> I think the people that went to see Australia went because it was the guy who played <laughs> Wolverine. Baz Luhrmann may have his fans, but not like Hugh Jackman does. I don't know. I, the, the, the thing with Jackman, and we, I've said this before, is just like he looks so good and he doesn't seem ready to give it up. So just keep milking it. You know yeah. what I mean? As many times as he will come back, ask him to come back. Until but as far as I know, looking he's... at him and going, oh, yeah, you know, you can't pull it off anymore. You're just too damn old or something. Then, yeah, OK, it's time to let him go. But I think he's far from that. I mean, holy crap. When he woke up in the past and he stands up and you see that guy's freaking chest and arms and crap, they're just like, it's insane. The freaking muscles on that dude. How he can do that is just, it's crazy, man. It's like Arnold Schwarzenegger-esque. Except for without the unnecessary bulk. I don't know how old the guy is, but uh, I can see him doing it for a long time if he looks like that now. Yeah, I think the only obstacle is whether he gets tired of doing it or not. And it sounds like, I mean, or the press he's done for this movie said he had so much fun making this movie that even though he had considered not doing it anymore, he's gone back on that. So we'll see. You know, I I was going to say, okay, let's give some positives and let's give some negatives. Uh, the, the only negatives really are, logically, it doesn't hold up, the movie. Uh-huh. You know, where you look at, like, the timeline, and, and all of the movies are like that. The continuity in between Fox, X-Men movies is all over the place. But if you can throw that out and say, you know, it doesn't matter that... Uh, Magneto lost his powers at the end of X-Men 3 or whatever, then it's cool. The, 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 but the, it, sto the, the filmmaking was solid, and the, the story was engrossing enough that it, I never sat and said, wait a second, now what happened in X-Men 3? Or wait a second, didn't he have bone claws at the end of the Wolverine? You know, that kind of stuff. It just, it, it exited my head, and I was just able to let the film carry me along. And I think that that is mostly due to Brian Singer's talents as a, a director. I like him as a director, and he has had his ups and downs, but he's still a relatively young guy. Maybe he can, you know, start doing what these other guys do and make one for me, and then I'll do an X-Men movie, and then I'll do one for me, and I'll do an X-Men movie. I, I, I don't yeah. know. I hope that uh, he manages to stick with the X-Men. It seems like, you know, it took him a long time, but now he's back. And hopefully he's back to stay. It's like he didn't know what... You don't know what you've got until it's gone kind of a thing. And it was gone, and now he's managed to get back to it. And it, you know, the last X-Men movie that Brian Singer directed was great, and it made huge money. And then there's this one, which... In my mind, I thought it was great, too. I loved this film. I did not find anything to really dislike from it. And as you're saying, it's already making huge money again. So it seems like Gold Times, he's back, and, you know, I don't see why. Hopefully he doesn't get that itch to go elsewhere again kind of thing. Like you were saying, do one for, one for me and one for them kind of a thing to scratch that itch I guess because I think Fox probably knows better than to let him go again if they can keep him they, they'll want him because it seems like he knows what to do with the X-Men films better than anyone else that's had a hand at them you know that's probably a good place to end we 
it, it's it, with Amazing Spider-Man. I had a list of stuff, and I could have kept going because it just there were so many things where I could see potential, and then they failed, or where there was no potential at all. He's like, why did he, they do that? There's still the the guy with the wacky accent. Holy cow! That cartoon character that showed up from part of Amazing Spider-Man. I mean, and we could talk about some of the new characters that showed up in this movie if we, if you wanted to, but. We kind of don't have to. It's just it. It was fun, and 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 all of the new X Men characters that they showed had visually interesting powers. Blink was so cool to watch with the Blink holes. Blink was the, the one that made the holes, the, the pink portals. Yeah, and there was Bishop, and then there was another guy that was kind of with Blink at the very very start. Well, there was Sunspot, the guy who basically looked like the Human Torch. Oh, um, that was Sunspot. I thought that yeah. was. What's his face? That was in the uh, earlier films. Although he Pyro, died, who was killed Pyro, in, he died in the end of three, didn't he? Mm -hmm. So I guess that makes sense. So that was Sunspot. That was somebody totally different. I didn't even think about that. That's another one of those guys where I should have looked at the actor, <laughs> like Kitty Pride, where I was like, oh, I finally realize it's her halfway through the movie. That's fine. And then there was Warpath. What was Warpath's power? Did he have one? It seemed like he's he's just sentinels. strong, uh, and he had yeah he's had really really good eyesight, which was fine. Is that what it is? He had good eyesight and he's strong. I, his I, power. I guess now. See, I I meant to talk about this at the very beginning. Uh, there's a guy at work who just loves to spoil movies. Holy cow! He lives for it. And yesterday I worked with him, and he wanted to spoil X Men. But the thing that he would tell me over and over again was how terrible it was. And he's just like, oh, and it was awful. And he says, I haven't seen a movie this bad since Transformers 2, Revenge of the Fallen. And I was just like, wow. Because that's like infamously bad. <laughs> but the fact that he really liked Amazing Spider-Man 2 and really hated this movie just kind of shows me that he lives in a bizarro universe. Uh -huh. And so anything that he says... I will have to just like throw out and when he says you know that it gets really really cold in winter I will wear shorts but it, and it's always good to have somebody say oh this movie you're about to see is terrible so that you go oh okay and be go hey that last scene wasn't terrible you know that scene wasn't terrible either hey Jennifer Lawrence is in this and you're able to say hey I had a really good time yeah having lowered expectations is always helpful with any movie because you know then it doesn't I mean, you know anything above the expectations you have is going to be better and if it's way above those expectations then you're like man this is a great film so yeah i, I didn't have any kind of ex expectations with this i'd heard people say it was good but i was a little apprehensive afraid uh, the x-men movies have been kind of weak of late it's been a while i mean i guess all the way back to x-men 2 is when the last time they had a great x-men film uh so you know i didn't have huge expectations with it because you know it's like going to amazing spider-man 2 you're not going to have high expectations for it because you saw the last one <laughs> and so you know that well, it's just going to be probably as good as maybe a little bit less good because sequels generally are less good than the one before them um so yeah my expectations weren't too high so it easily rose to them and superseded them so yeah i'm looking forward to apocalypse the guy that was apocalypse in the little post credit scene uh-huh looked very small didn't he you mean like not muscular or? like yeah apocalypse is ginormously large he's like a dude they made him a build a figure once, didn't they? Because he was so right, big. But his one of his mutant, he's able to change his size, so he can be a regular sized guy, or he can be a massive guy, and so. Okay. And yeah, he, Apocalypse is one of those '90s. Well, although he was created in the '80s, I was going to say '90s characters that's just so ridiculously overpowered, like Venom or like Bane or Doomsday, or you know, one of those characters. Although Venom was the '80s as well. But uh, I, I know very little about the apocalypse except for that he was the first mutant and he's thousands of years old. And so uh, uh, hopefully if I find very little out about the comic version of apocalypse, I won't uh, be disappointed when they stray from it in this next movie. But you do know this Days of Future Past comic really well, right? Yes. 
Was there parts that really disappointed you that were strayed, that they strayed from, or was... Well, no, the whole movie strayed, except for the premise of a character from the the apocalyptic future. Very, very bad Very bad future. future comes back now to prevent that from happening. Um, but, I mean, they had the Sentinels, and... Uh, what did you think of the Sentinels? They were very different. I didn't comic like Sentinels. the organic Sentinels or you know super futuristic Sentinels, but I thought the big purple Sentinels were beautiful, dude. The ones from the the seventies, the seventies timeline. Yeah, I thought they were rad. I mean, they yes, they looked like they could actually exist, but they also looked like the purple Neil Adams Sentinels, you know, uh-huh. <laughs> from the comic books and. The fact that they left them purple is one of those things, you know, where it's <laughs> like, wow, somebody made that decision to, to have them be purple instead of a badass color. And whoever made that decision, I appreciate that they did it. Stand it, up it, and applaud. And I don't know. Maybe there are people in the audience that are like, why, why are they purple, guys? Did Prince design these? But I never even, it didn't even occur to me until just now while we were talking that, yeah, they were purple and that might have been a brave choice. But for me, the, the Sentinels have always been purple. Mm-hmm. And so... It's just, you know, it's like, well, that's how they were. I might have noticed if they weren't. Uh, well, what did you think of them? Yeah, I didn't like the future ones either. They didn't seem like Sentinels to me. They were kind of small as far as Sentinels go. I guess, you know, they were supposed to be really tough to kill and stuff and making them non-metal and making them able to do the powers and stuff that the guys had makes them more difficult makes them like a super scroll or something to defeat you know they have all the powers so it works to give you that you know it's kind of like you have the 70s version and then you have okay they keep getting better and better and here they are in the future they've evolved to this which is unbeatable um they Reminded me a lot of the Destroyer robot from Iron <laughs> they Man. They did, yeah. They even had the head open up yeah. and fire come out. The face opened up and shot flames and stuff like that out of them, which is kind of a bummer because that's a superhero franchise, but a separate superhero franchise didn't need to be copied or, or whatever you want to call it. But they were neat. I do like the the old ones, and I I did like uh, I just did it, well. The did the purple stand out to you at all? At any point, did you go the purple? It didn't. No, I didn't stand out to me. I didn't think about that either. But that is cool that they did that. I the Sentinel is one of my favorite things from X Men, and it's one of the you know when I first started getting into X Men, and when I first started, you and I were selling toys on eBay. The Sentinel was the thing that Marvel Legends had as their build-a-figure. And it was a super cool figure. I just loved it. I still have mine. It's on my shelf at home, and uh, it's just one of my favorite toys of all time. And it's it's just a really cool thing. And I remember the Sentinels from the 90s cartoons of the X-Men as being something very cool. And, yeah, it's just one of those things that I like a lot the the sentinels and you know the danger and the, all that kind of stuff that they entail so i really like that they told a story with sentinels in it in the movies because it's just one of my favorite storylines um that's one of the things that's really cool about comic books is you got you know as long as it's not some brand new character you've got years and years and years of stories to choose from it's like let's make a general hospital movie what story should we tell? You know, they've got a billion stories to choose from because that show went on forever. This is the same thing, you know. It's General Hospital, but with superpowers. And so they got tons of stuff to choose from. And, you know, it's neat. I, I'm excited. It's interesting because if you go back to when this wave of superhero movies began... I believe you say that Blade was the first superhero movie in this wave. Basically. I do say that, but you say X Men, and that's fine. X Men was a much bigger X-Men hit. X Men because it was a big hit, and it, I, you know, I didn't even realize Blade was a comic book movie. I just assumed it was more a horror slash action movie kind of a thing instead. It doesn't seem like it's part of the same genre. Maybe it's just because it didn't overlap in any way with anything else. I don't know, but the X Men movie came out. 
And ex to tell you the truth, I never saw that movie in the theater, and I hadn't seen it all the way up until right before X-Men 2 came out. And I had a friend that I worked with who liked comic books a lot, and he told me a lot about the stories of the X-Men and stuff like that. And so I decided, I went out and I rented the X-Men movie, and I saw it probably a week before I saw X-Men 2. And I thought, that was a really cool movie. And then I saw X-Men 2, and I was really, really excited. I loved X-Men 2. And, it, and I think to this day, it's still probably my favorite superhero film of all time. I, when I go down and I make the list, I put it at number one still, because it's like the first one that set me on the path that I wound up walking. If it weren't for that movie, I probably would not do this podcast or the other Dune Steve podcast that we do. It's just kind of, it's what got me going on, on that kind of stuff. When X-Men fell apart, it was kind of sad. You know, I, I didn't even, like we said, I, I still haven't even seen The Wolverine because the X-Men franchise got to the point where me, who loved it above all others, didn't even want to see it. Couldn't be bothered to go to see it even when it was in the dollar movies. But after seeing this movie that we just saw i'm really excited to see the next one and it's years off not, i'm excited not long, though. well yeah not really long especially considering how old we are it'll be a blink of the eye yeah and we'll be here again recording our post apo post apocalyptic podcast uh -huh. <laughs> but i'm excited about it again after seeing that one i'm excited about the x-men again and that's cool to me i really am glad that that's the case i'm glad that brian singer's back i maybe i just really like his films i don't know what it is but i'm glad to see it back in the where it is i don't know if you have any similar feelings towards it but i'm excited well yeah i don't think i'm as uh, as gung-ho about it as you are and i've never felt like the fox x-men movies have equaled the splendor of the comics but uh i've enjoyed them all we did an episode for X-Men First Class. We did an episode for X-Men Origins Wolverine. And we did an episode for X-Men 3, The Voyage Home or whatever. And I liked all three of those movies, if you want to go back and listen to those. And I don't eat my words. I, I liked them all. I, I just I think I, I lower my expectations for these movies because I know they're not going to be faithful to the source material. And as long as they're well-done films on their own then then I can be happy for them and, and yeah I will see the next one um, whereas you know Man of Steel or Amazing Spider-Man 2 it doesn't leave me just longing to see the next installment in, in the movie franchise and, and so I don't know I, I, I did want to talk a tiny bit about Magneto and whether he worked for you whether he's like is he a villain is he not a villain mm. and I've, I've granted that's how except for the very first movie that's how it's always been with Magneto, but I don't, you know, I don't know if I were doing uh, X Men Apocalypse with the first class crew, if I would even have Magneto in it. I like Fassbender, but I, is he integral to the franchise? And, and and maybe that's a rhetorical question. I don't know if he is or not. I don't think he is. I think that they could be fine without him if they have a, a good enough villain. He's been interesting the way that they've used him back and forth and here and there and. I guess if you want to go there, movies that don't have him in it make less money because the Wolverine movies did not have Magneto in them. But, you know, I think they can go either way. If they've got Apocalypse, I don't think they need Magneto because they've got somebody that's huge enough to fight against that it's unnecessary. And I thought he was good. You know, it's interesting that despite all the stuff that they said he never really got with them you know they, they got him out they made him part of their team and he just took it all in his own he had his own plan and he did his own thing and they were as much fighting this deadly future that was headed their way as they were fighting Magneto's stupid plan that was causing him as much pr trouble and I thought that was cool. I'm glad that he didn't. He was like, That's oh, consistent, okay, yeah. Isn't it? Let's let's just get together then, you know. And he's been that way, you know. There was X2, was X Men United, where the bad guys and the good guys had to join together to fight against Striker. In that one, he did the same kind of thing. I mean, he was with them, but he wasn't with them, and so it was really consistent uh, to his character. 
and the thing with this the stadium was really cool i mean it yeah. just looked great and yeah. uh, uh the the stuff with mckellen there where he said you know i spent too long fighting here charles or whatever at the end uh, that was pretty cool yeah i thought that was interesting as he was fighting him you know we're cutting back and forth from future to past he's fighting against him in the past and apologizing for it in the future at the same time basically one thing that's really cool about x-men is just how vast and varied a property that the x-men is they are so huge that of all the properties that marvel doesn't have control of so they can't integrate them into their world i think it's the one that does the best you know that can be the best anyways all by itself you slice it off and just mutants over here everybody else over here you won't be able to do certain storylines that are you know from those various marvel crossover type events when it was mutants versus everybody else or whatever but there's a jillion a quintillion that's a real word quintillion as opposed to a jill there's so many mutants so many characters that they could do stories of it's like disney now has star wars and they're like all right well let's do a han solo movie and let's do a yoda movie and there's all these characters that they can tell the story of if they want to and similar to that is the x-men there's so many characters that they could split off and do their story and the x-men bishop story or x-men you know whoever yeah, something that, I mean, the success of this movie will open a couple of doors. Whereas if this movie had not made its money back, those doors would remain locked. But I think, and granted you people in the future know that I'm totally crazy, but I think that we'll see another solo Wolverine movie. I think we'll see, you know, X-Men Apocalypse. And I think within, like, let's say within six years, we're going to see X-Men Fantastic Four. A crossover film with those two properties. Now, granted, I don't give a crap about this new Fantastic Four movie, but you throw the X-Men into it, and I'll be like, oh, okay. And right before, maybe you and I will rent that awful 2015 Fantastic Four flick and be like, oh, you know what? <laughs> that was all right. But yeah, I look forward to the future of the X-Men. The days of future will be good in the past. <laughs> oh, really? Really? That, that's how you want to go out in the days of future? Oh, you're the fast, you're the, you're the, do another take, man. You're the one that was already talking about the people in the future that are going to know that you're crazy. Yeah. So you started it, so there. But And they, they have Deadpool, too, which I, I feel disappointed that we haven't gotten. Now, I don't have a huge emotional attachment to that character, but I know there are people out there that do. And if they could just make an efficient, cheap movie about Deadpool, people would go to it. I would go to it. And uh, it's, they, they say they're going to do an X-Force movie, which is, you know, a team that both Wolverine and Deadpool are on. And so, you know, maybe that'll work too. Maybe that could be the next solo Wolverine movie, which is not quite solo, but it's as solo as any of his other movies have been. It's not like there weren't other X-Men in them. Yeah. Uh, well, again, you said something a, a few minutes ago like an hour ago. But for Fox, the future looks bright. For the X-Men franchise, the future looks bright. Now, I don't know if it's so bright they got to wear shades, but uh, it feels nice when you go see something and you want to see the one after it. And so many times movies will burn their bridges or they'll throw so much into something that you'll be like, okay, no, enough, guys. No, you, that was enough for three movies, and I'm not satisfied. Or she's like, why? Why did it have to cost so much money? Or why did, you know, all that stuff. But this one, I felt like it was just enough. It yeah. had a bunch of people that we liked. It opened doors for new characters that we have <laughs> yet to get to know. And uh, and like you said, the, the, the there are so many potential stories and so many characters and places that it will go. Disney is going to try and do, and we'll see if they're successful, a Star Wars movie a year. The same way that Marvel Studios is doing one or more Marvel's comics movies a summer. And yeah, X-Men has just as much potential for stories as Star Wars does. 
if they have your yearly Star Wars movie in December and your yearly X-Men movie in May or whatever, I'll be fine with that. Right. This movie was in the Goldilocks zone. That said <laughs> yeah, about planets. I like that. Planets are in the Goldilocks zone if they're in the just right area where they might be able to support life. This one was in the just right area where they didn't overdo it and it wasn't too lame. It was just right. Future for X Men Fox X Men may not be so bright. You need to wear shades, but you at least got to wear those the glasses that, like, if you look at the sun, then they they tint automatically for you. <laughs> are the glasses like that? Yeah. Is that what Cyclops had on? At the very end <laughs> Maybe of that that's movie? what those were. His glasses were pretty ugly. They were like supposed to be futuristic looking, but they were pretty ugly. Ah oh, well. But that's all good. It was good stuff. Um, I guess we've probably come to our conclusion here. Sure. And uh, hopefully uh, you guys have seen this already and you enjoyed it as much as us. If you haven't seen it already, sorry we spoiled, the, we spoiled the whole thing for you. And sorry about that. But it's your own fault. We told you time and again not to listen to these if you haven't seen it. So there you go. Thanks for listening. And uh, we'll see you again next time. Good night. See ya. That Gets My Go is produced under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives License. Sad but true. We are the Doonstiff, Charles. Not them.